The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time for challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. And we're back. Welcome back to Night Fright, folks. I'm your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, fans of Horror Etc. Podcast. We've got Tony with us. We had Ted. I don't know where Ted's gone. He might and come back. We have Lisa Man. Ghost got him. To- Hello. Uh, Anthony, why don't you introduce your new wife? Lisa is the individual that we usually leave the parties apologizing for now, which is a wonderful <laughs> change of events. No, usually, no, no usually it's, I'm, it's still him. I'm, well, it's true. It's true. It's still him. No, Lisa. Lisa is a uh, Lisa is an actress, and uh, we Sometimes. we actually met at one of my film premieres a couple of years ago. Ghost two Keepers, years ago, almost right. two years ago now. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we uh, stayed in touch I on and off. It's been two years. Two years, yes, yes. I haven't made a good movie in two years. No, uh, we stayed in touch, and lo and behold, uh, you know, we uh, we 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 found our partners in crime and partners in life with each other. So, so all that sappy violin stuff that the horror etc. podcast community isn't used. What's what's this? Oh, oh. Tri- www.nightfrightshow. Anthony is a filmmaker, as you know. If you've been listening in the first, who hold that one? I'll hold this one. Okay. okay. Now there's two. And um, www.nightfrightshow. You can click on any of these covers here, and that'll take you right to a place where you can order them from the comfort of your own home. And I would recommend every single one of them. It's Halloween, folks. This is set part two of our Halloween show. I've seen and, them all. Uh, I'd recommend them all, too. But oh, then you, again, I'm a little biased. You're so. a little biased. I don't know if I can do that. If I pop off, she gets the royalty check. Uh-huh. Right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you could retire to where if you got the royalty check? I'd probably be a partner Napanese. across the way. It's smaller. Okay, yes. yes. Now, let's talk about tattoos. Tattoos? Yes. yes. What about tattoos? So let's just say you were going to get a tattoo. What kind of tattoo would you get? Do you think? I I want to make sure that I would get something that wouldn't um, that wouldn't overstate itself and uh, draw attention away from the uh, the Prince Albert. <laughs> Lovely. Oh God. Oh God. We go everywhere here, folks. I think the word we're looking for now is anyway. <laughs> how about, how about you? No, no, more like more like awkward silence with crickets. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. I love that sound. I love the sound of discomfort. It's... <laughs> and so, if you were to get one, what would you do? I'm not sure yet. I've got a few ideas, but yeah, I'm not you, sure yet. You don't want to share them? We're going to do something tacky. Mm, we'll we're, we're talking about getting one of those couple tattoos. It's not tacky. Aww. It's yes. cute. So when you put your arms it's together, cute. is that the idea? It's like one continuous. No, 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 no we don't just... actually have a design in mind yet. Well, that's not true. We have one. We don't have a specific design. It's going to be a Doctor but. Who themed. I'm going to have the Doctor mm. tattoo. She's going to have companion. Let's talk some more about your Doctor Who or we'll both, experience. Or we'll get I? like hearts linked or something and have Doctor. Oh, that'll companion. be nice. That would be cute. Yeah. Okay. A Christmas Carol. You were in a Christmas Sweet. Carol. Anthony just made a Christmas Carol. I was. Carol. I was in Christmas Carol. Yes, you were. What, what part did you play? I played Mrs. Dilber. Oh, Mrs. His, Dilber. Uh, okay. Scrooge's housekeeper. Was she a grump? <clears throat> she was. Was she sketchy? Sketchy. Smug, <laughs> smug about him having kicked it. Really? Yeah, having kicked it. Well, <laughs> he was he was such an ass to everybody else, right? You can only imagine how he treated her. That's true. That's true. And the thing about um, I I mean I mean she's an iconic character who has 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 one sequence in this film, but, but she did exceedingly well. And, I don't know about uh, that, but thank you. He, she's the only woman I know who can make uh, make make absolute frump attire look 
ravishing. Trumpet I have fun with Trumpet that. Trumpet ravishing. Cole on her face and everything. <laughs> which was Ted, actually, are you there, my friend? Cole, which was actually... Hello, hello. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. Welcome back. Back again. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. Ted is back, and he's from uh, Horror Etc. Podcast as, uh, as, as well. And um, he's, he's, not in, he's not in town. He's away from town, and so he's... Uh, He's where the aliens live, as I like to say. He's in Ottawa. Right? Where the aliens still, live. Yeah, you know, still aliens. drinking, though. Still drinking. Uh, if I may be so bold as to call back to Crimson Peak just one last time. Absolutely. You keep going, buddy. Good movie. I, I, have a, I have a theory as to why Anthony appreciates this movie so much. Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> oh, because of the fact that it's riddled with homage to his favorite movie, The Changeling. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Um, right down to the dog's ball, Anthony. The ball and and the wheelchair. Of course, the wheelchair. Yes, the wheelchair was. But wonderful. I mean, the whole mystery—they're unraveling with the mystery, and it's very, uh, it's very similar in a lot of ways. Well, yeah, Guillermo del Toro. I, I mean, I've again, I, I I talked about this earlier on, but I'm going. I can't say it enough. I consider the cha- the Changeling is my favorite film of all time. Again, not to be confused with the Clint Eastwood Angelina Jolie film. This. These are different stories, different movies, nothing to do with each other. Um, the 1980, 80, uh, 1980 uh, Peter Maydak film is, uh, is, is a masterpiece. It's, in my opinion, the greatest haunted house movie ever made. Wow. And I'm saying that knowing you know, the history of haunted house films on screen, including um, The Haunting and The Uninvited, which I love, Legend of Hell House. But The Changeling is special. Um, That's not haunted house. House on Haunted Hill as also well. Good. But the change thing is special. Why is it special? It's special for many reasons. Uh, I have a personal connection with it in that it was the, my first experience with horror when I was a kid. Um, I remember waking up in the middle of the night. We are living in Montreal. How old were you? About four years old. Thank you. Four years old. And I woke up in the middle of the night and wandered into the den, and my mother was watching the Late Late Show on CFCF12, mm. which was the, uh, the CTV affiliate in, uh, okay. in Montreal. And it was a pivotal scene involving the wheelchair uh, that I walked in on, and, and I never forgot that image. It terrified me as a kid and stuck with me. But of course, I eventually found the film and needed to watch it, the whole thing, to revisit this nightmarish moment when, you know, just a few years later. And it's been a perennial watch for me ever since. My favorite film of all time. Wonderful central performance Not by George C. Scott. Nightmarish, but what the hell is going on here? Yeah, absolutely. It leaves you with like a, ah, you feel unsettled just watching it. Uh, the music, the direction, the performance. Um, but but uh, Guillermo del Toro has actually said that he would, he holds that film in high regard, and uh, if anyone was to remake The Changeling, it would have to be him. I think he did. I have a question for Lisa. Okay. <laughs> What's up, Ted? Well, Anthony mentioned in the first half of the show that he introduced you recently, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I understood this to mean that this is your first time watching The Exorcist. It was. Yeah. And therefore, yeah, my question is clearly, what the hell did you think of that? It was good. I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoy the fact that I can now finally say I have seen The Exorcist, which is, you know, classic film, right? Classic horror. But did it affect you? Did it have an effect? Um, there it was... sure did. I sat next to you on the couch. It Yes. No, yes. no, I'm not. I'm not easily. I'm not easily scared. That's but, true. She's no, seen me were... naked, and yeah, I'll just step out of the picture. You're gonna, Brent, when you, Brent, you need to, you need to insert some crickets in here. But anyway, oh my god, um, there were there were a few creepy scenes. Yeah, definitely. When you um, creepy, this is a the... seeing the seeing this the daughters. Is, I... Seeing the daughter's transformation and mm. this, you know, just this descent in, you know, from something, mm-hmm. from this little girl who was so sweet to, you know, someone who was so possessed. evil and possessed and evil and. Did the sound it, it affect you at all? The sound of her voice—that's what always got me when I first saw it. Not so much. Not really. No. No. Really. no. How about you, Ted? What are your recollections? Well, the Exorcist, the Exorcist is one fight. of those movies that really effectively captures the atmosphere of dread. I mean, and that whole movie is heavy with this unsettling feeling, mm-hmm. and it's a really difficult thing to explain because it's this intangible, right? It's a, it's an aspect of the composition that just has this effect on your subconscious. I think. Well, uh, yes, uh, that's right. 
opening from the scenes in Iraq and flowing through to the final sort of battle with the devil to the death, uh, this movie really is pretty unrelenting, and it is a heavy blanket all over the whole affair. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that I, I think that the version you've never seen had an added sequence uh, where uh, Karen is listening to the recording yes. in the library basement. And, uh, I mean, by the, that point in the movie, when you hear that audio, I find it's just impactful in a way that most movies aren't able to achieve. Yeah, Ted, I'll, I'll agree with you. Um, one of the comments that we passed while watching it was that the movie feels evil to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you feel did. unsettled. You feel for dirty sure. for watching it. That you're going to bring something home with you. Mm -hmm. It was it was creepy. It was freaky. But it wasn't like, for me, it wasn't, you know, up all night, terrified with the lights on or anything like that. But think... it was, it was, there was definitely a feeling of unease, a feeling of... Well, see, for for me, that movie does does cause that. It's very very atmospheric, for sure. Do you think that's because it's I'm become not so much? Anything? No, I'm, please. I, I... <laughs> do, do do you think it's because the movie is so much um, so much a part of a, 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 a popular culture now, and there's been so many riffs on it, so many moments on it. Like you said to me Scary at one point, ah, oh, look, it's the poster. Scary movie too. There's been so many parodies. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because it's so embedded in the in in in, in pop culture right now okay. that we that it wasn't as fresh? I felt the same way Maybe. when I saw The Godfather for the first time. Yeah. Mm. You know all these stereotypes that you know I associated with that type of film. We did we did watch Scary Movie and we did watch Scary Movie Two recently and Scary Movie Two. Don't judge. Parodies. Me. We were bored. Okay. Absolutely. Parodies I very think... heavily in the beginning. Parodies uh, The Exorcist. And that that was definitely in my mind when we when we started watching it. So that the best description I've ever Maybe. heard of The Exorcist was the one that you gave, Lisa, and that is it feel it feels evil mm. to watch it. Mm. I think that was uh, precise and, and right and hit the nail mm. on the head. No good question. It, it does um, it does give you a feeling of as an actress. Could you play a part like that? I would like to. I think really? that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. It wouldn't, you know, haunt you to uh, to do something. Uh, like that? You mean you mean to play a character that's possessed by a demon yeah. that, that who who almost think, does a hundred and eighty personality wise. Yeah. She does that a, once a month. <laughs> I think that would be a really interesting. Um, How goes it with you, Ted? Something really interesting <laughs> to explore. We're right out of control but anyway, at this point. Anyway. Go. <laughs> No, you know, I'm not that bad. I'm not. No, she's not. She's not. Not, she's not, not nearly. No, absolutely. Oh, no, no. Ever seen The Shining? I'm entirely manageable. But anyway. Manageable. Man manageable. Ha. <laughs> anyway. So, you think the Blue Jays got ripped off, guys, or what? <laughs> this is why I adore her. <laughs> <laughs> How are things in the nation's capital, Ted? Oh, it's just as good as ever. I mean, uh, you know what's an interesting horror anecdote for you? About one year ago. Go sorry, today. Did, well, did was you one say year ago, interesting horror anecdote or interesting horror anecdote? I, I just want to get that clear. You are in the nation's capital. That's right. Well, things are degenerating on your end. I got to tell you. <laughs> not, not an audio sense. Save us. Save us. <laughs> I just want to point out that was her, not me. I just want to say that was her, right. not me. I'm going to just do, um, I'm just going to do all I know to do, and that is distract and uh, sidetrack the conversation. Picking up another movie that I'm going to throw your way. Just a quick recommendation. It's called Late Phases. So if it's Halloween weekend and you're looking for something that's a little unusual, Late Phases is a werewolf story that's told uh, from the perspective of senior citizens. It stars Nick Michi, who is a fantastic mature actor. He was in Stake Land. He's been in a few uh, films we've talked about on Horror, etc. But here he plays a, a sort of a vet, a senior vet blind. And he's moving to a senior's community where a werewolf has been stalking and attacking the senior citizenry. So he does battle with his werewolf as a blind man, and it sounds ludicrous, it sounds ridiculous, and it's very low budget, and That's I don't know why this would be appealing, except it's a genuinely good time, and it's a very unusual uh, approach to the subject matter. So Late Phases is a recommendation that's on Netflix right now. Thanks for that, Ted. Oh, it is on Netflix right now. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. We'll have to watch that. We'll have to watch the that. The Vatican Definitely. Tapes. I understand you were a fan of the, a movie called The Vatican Tapes. I've never seen The Vatican Tapes, and I, based on what I've heard of it, I'm not in any big rush. Okay. 
Okay, fair enough. Have you guys seen the that movie? Good, eh? uh, I have it lined no. up, but I haven't watched it yet. No. Okay. I was just curious. What's the next big horror film coming out that you guys want to go and see? What's coming down the pipe, Anthony? I don't know, Ted. What is coming down? Well, I mean, there's there's a new Halloween reboot that's on its way out. There's a new uh, Leatherface prequel coming out. Oh. Um, there is a new Nightmare on Elm Street film coming out. Really? i got to be honest. I'm looking very forward to Ash vs. the Evil Dead, the TV series. Mm. Yes. I'm enjoying, we, we are enjoying Scream Queens as well. Oh, Scream Queens is great. The Ryan Murphy TV series, Scream which has Queens been quite fun. a surprise. Yes. Yeah. Quite a surprise. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's really grown on us. We hate it. I hated the first, uh, the first episode and I've grown to really enjoy it. I didn't hate it, but it was, it was turned out different than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, not really sure what I was expecting, but it was, I was a little bit lukewarm, I guess, on the first episode. And then by the second, it was like, okay, I it's, really like it's this. It's the humor. It's that Ryan Murphy yeah. humor, and uh, yeah. it's quirky and very referential. I mean, there's so many nods to different horror films uh, mm-hmm. uh, in it, uh, including The Changeling, including The Shining, including Exorcist Three. There was an Exorcist Three, Ted, uh, uh, kind of riff on the on the hospital corridor sequence. Really impressed. <laughs> Lisa Mann, Anthony DP Mann. And Kingstown Ted, Horror and, Central uh, Podcast. And Bert Holly. And Bert Holly right here, folks. Get the coffee going, get the tea going, or a beverage of your choice going. And uh, in this particular case, some people have a beverage of their choice going. And, and that's not a bad thing. We're celebrating Halloween and all the creepiness that surrounds this holiday. October 31st. Ooh. My great aunt was born October 31st. Oh, that's a cool she, birthday. She's passed away. Yeah. And she was clairvoyant no word of a lie she could read really? tea leaves i'll give you a good example she read my cousin's tea leaves and my cousin was 16 and she said within a year you will have an engagement ring well my cousin had a boyfriend my grandmother passed away and left the, her engagement ring for her oh yeah so be careful what you wish for folks halloween why is this your favorite time of year ted you've mentioned that to me more and more listen what is a good scary subject to bring up as we approach Hallow's Eve this year? I'm not really scared by anything. That's the thing, Ted. You know, it's interesting, and we've talked about this on the podcast. I, Lisa can attest to this, I scream. I, 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 I am. I get very yes. scared in movies still. I still jump. I still jump scream. Scares. I. No, 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 not even jump scares, but I mean, certain things get to me, and I will react to them. I haven't, I've never lost that that sensitivity to, uh, to to on-screen fright. But you have. Nothing does scare you anymore. What, what was the last thing that scared you? There's a film that is uh, what you would consider independent, I suppose. The budget was uh, 70000 good from 2011. The film is called Absentia. Uh, many people have recommended it. It's I, taken I've me a while it. to get to it. With, uh, with Doug Jones. Yes. So you, have you seen been, this? Seen yeah, I have. I've seen Absentia. Uh, I'm uh, I'm hesitant to use the word scared, but I tell you, it it is very very effective at presenting some unsettling image early on, and it's nothing that is really too difficult to achieve. I mean, it's essentially having a character in the background of the shot, uh, just doing something unusual or, or off-putting, and, and just having this presence through the first act into the second act of the film, I found it very engrossing, very uh, um, scary. As a dad, how do you how do you discern what to, to let your kids watch and what not to? Well, we're up to speed on The Walking Dead, so really, I have no filter. <laughs> you have no filter. What about the youngest one? Uh, far too uh, far too precious for such things. Okay. Okay. <laughs> too delicate of a flower. <laughs> and your wife is she into uh, horror? I'm already or... concerned about the. T- I'm already concerned about tendencies, so I'll just keep her away from the, <laughs> the lesser <laughs> material. Give her any ideas. You don't want to give her ideas. <laughs> um, in Kingston, Ted, we have something, uh, and folks around the world, uh, I'd like to let you in on apathy. <laughs> We have something Lethargy? called Fort Fright, oh. where we've taken an old 1825, I think it was made 1825, uh, fort, and every year there's a theme to it. A few years ago there was a zombie theme to it, and uh, the idea is you take your family through this Fort Fright and down some uh, creepy hallways and things of that nature. Have you been this year, Ted, with the kids? 
Uh, not yet. I'm scheduled to go on Thursday night. It's an annual event. Uh, it gets it, it varies in cheesiness, but it's always an entertaining couple hours. Uh, oh, Gregory okay. and uh, Leanne, have you been there yet? You guys been? Uh, no, uh, not, about not this year. About maybe going you know, you know, oddly enough, we actually shot Terror of Dracula at Fort Henry. Well, tell us about that. How did that shooting go? Oh, it was fascinating. My first job when I came to Kingston was actually working for the Ghost Tour briefly, uh, choreographing actors at Fort Henry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some spooky things did indeed happen. Uh, nothing was so terrifying as having to negotiate with Fort Henry to actually film mm. on site there. And uh, I've heard the, the stories. And, and, and the bill they presented us uh, in, in apparent support of a community project was probably the most horrifying aspect of them all. Um, but the, the very, very first installment of Fort Fright was quite impressive. Quite impressive indeed, actually, because it was something different. Um, again, I think less is more. Um, and my last couple of experiences there have not been as positive. Well, I, I understand several years ago when it was the zombie theme, um, they had actually asked you to come down and coach yeah. the actors that were going to really? play the zombies. Yeah, I actually came and in and did tell a Tell us a bit about that experience. Yes, yeah. I, I went. I went. I went there and coached some actors in, in, in the art of portraying a zombie. How the art of, of of scaring people. How did you do? What did you say to them to do that? Well, you know, it's it's a matter you know it's a matter of understanding what fear is and how it works, and again, how less is more. I have always said you can get more. Fa okay, so one of my favorite sequences in the original Paranormal Activity yeah. is a sequence where uh, the camera's running at night. The female, the the girl, Katie, gets up, and she stands by the side of the bed of her uh, of her partner. And for literally, I think, one and a half or two hours, she's just standing there looking down at him. Nothing happens, but she's standing, she's staring, and again, it was such a subtle moment, and yet there's so much horror to be found within that whole, uh, that whole situation. That's really interesting. And um, you were directed by Anthony at one point. How was that? In Christmas Carol. In Christmas Carol, yeah. How was that for you? Was that a good experience? It was good. Yeah. yeah. The whole, the whole, um, the whole time that I was, I went to Long Sioux with a bunch of the cast and, and the crew and it was, it was what, three days we were there? Yeah. Sunday, Monday, yeah, three days. And, uh, end of March to beginning, no, it would have been just the end of March. And, uh, it was, it was a great time. All right. Caller, are you there? Caller? Hello. You gotta speak up, my friend. Hello. Hello. Am I on the, am I on the line? Yes, you are. Do you have a question for Anthony hey, or sorry. Ted or Lisa? Couldn't, couldn't hear you that well. This is this is Anthony. You know me from the horror etc. group. Oh. Uh, from one Anthony to another. How you doing, Anthony? You mean, this is Anthony Rotolo. Yes, that's right. Oh, Hi. wonderful! Actually, actually, you know what? We um, we actually are humbled to have Anthony here. Um, and Anthony has been a very, very active member of the horror etc. community for for quite some time. Um, however, Anthony, I, I find your own pursuits uh, so much more exciting than anything that we're doing. Um, and Anthony works in the the publishing industry, um, and he has been uh, very, very kind to the program in the past, um, making certain items available uh, to us. And, and also providing lots of insight um, to us over the years. Uh, he's also been uh, exceptionally um, uh, helpful to us with Christmas Carol. He actually designed that amazing poster in DVD. Oh, art. and your graphics yeah, are yeah. kick ass. Yeah, yeah. They and, really are. Yeah. Buddy. And you know, this, I didn't realize that. And, and, congratulations. And, th and this is another example of, of, of the power in, in the power of, of, of independent production. Podcasting opened the doors uh, to so many things uh, for, for, for myself, that horror, etc. community. Um, and uh, another perfect example is uh, the relationship that we have with, uh, with, with the other Anthony here, um, you know, uh, who, who just swooped in and made things so much easier to help get uh, this very, very special, you know, passion project of mine out in a way that people are going to say, hey, that looks good. We're going to grab that. So, so forever in your debt, Anthony. Oh, well, hey, I'm happy to help you guys. You know, it's a wonderful time. It's it's a really empowering time. Where I'm very inspired by what you're doing as well. You know, we um, all the power dynamics have shifted. Shift, you know, where instead of 
um, hoping that some publisher or some other entity picks you. You can just pick yourself and, and do your passion projects. So it's very exciting to see you doing what you've been doing over the years. Um, I saw your trailer for Christmas Carol recently. I think it looks wonderful. I wanted to congratulate on you on that. And Thank you. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Wonderful. Well, you know what? Uh, thank, it should be. Th th yeah, we're, we're, so we're proud of it. And thanks to your efforts, uh, a lot a lot more people are going to see it. We just uh, we just actually uh, launched uh, ticket sales for our world premiere screening here in Kingston. It's at a very illustrious 750-seater uh, theater. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that poster uh, is actually already up on their website, and it's going to be going up outside the theater. And I can't wait for people to respond to that. Because, you know, it's, you know not, not only do we have you know, the, the wonderful graphic of the Christmas Carol, I, I get to have my mug there, but you know, next to my mug is Colin Baker, who's one, you know, one of my heroes, and that was a that was a great design. A Anthony, let's talk about um, now. I'm sorry, is it Red Rocket Press? Oh, the well, the books I've done. I have I call it my hobby press. Whenever I have time, I've published some books. It's called Rocket Ride Books. Rocket Ride Books. Yes, sorry, not um, Red. Not Red Rock, and I know I've called it Red Rock on the podcast before too. And Ted's always stepped in. T tell us, <laughs> tell us about the imprint, and tell us about the type of work that you've produced because you've actually published some high-profile material. Yeah, you know, I've, uh, I've been fortunate; I've been able to publish some some neat um, titles. Um, I've just had a handful of them, but it, the way it started was uh, my background is design, graphic design. I've worked for publishers. I'm actually in the e-learning industry now, which is which is also related to design and technology and, and all of it. But uh, in terms of my passion projects, um, being connected with just my interest in horror and genre stuff, um, several years back I noticed that the story behind the movies The Thing from Another World in the 50s and then the John Carpenter version in the 80s, I noticed that the original story by... John W. Campbell had kind of fallen on hard times, publishing-wise. It was buried in books. That the, the only copy you could get at one point, literally when you went onto Amazon, all you saw, there wasn't even a dust jacket, all you saw was a blue square. It was yeah. just the cloth cover of a hard <laughs> hardback. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I started scratching at this and thinking, I wonder if there's something there. So I tr tracked down the rights, and I was very fortunate. I was able to figure out and get connected with the person who could license it uh, to me um, for uh, a book. And the other opportunity that came out of it was I was able to develop the, the first ever audio edition. So uh, it, was, it was just able, you know, I was able to raise the profile of this thing a little bit. And then for another weird coincidence, I got connected with William F. Nolan. William F. Nolan is known for Logan's Run and for Burnt Offerings. He, he did the screenplay first. For that, he did the normal states. He did uh, a trilogy of terror. Um, you know that work with Dan Curtis. But anyway, uh, no one had uh, developed a screenplay that it actually got passed over to the John Carpenter screenplay mm -hmm. while that project was in development hell. But the his screen treatment represented um, this this additional old cinematic take on the source material that would be very interesting to fans. So I got him to write an introduction and, and let me reprint his screen treatment. So I was able to put it all together with, with Campbell's original story in, in one volume that would be you know, just easier to you know, put out there and for people to find. And then uh, the audio version, which was kind of fun, and that was, that's out on Audible now. So that kind of started it. And this is, this is an endeavor. It's a hobby type of level thing. So as I've been able to, I've published a few titles uh, in addition to that. But that, that's what started it all. That, that, that one I'm especially proud of. Well, we did a, um, we did a, a giveaway, th a courtesy uh, uh, of, of yourself, um, of, the, uh, of, of, of the Thing books, the, the story that inspired the Thing. And it was, I remember that when the volumes arrived, they were beautifully beautifully bound little hardback editions and i thought wow this is the perfect format because the i mean I, I have a kindle which i enjoy but there's something about the feel of certain books the, um you, you know the, the dimensions the texture the mm -hmm. smell 
there's something about that experience if yeah. it's uh, if, if the package is right yes. um, that makes you know makes the whole process so much more enjoyable. Finding a fun bookmark. Finding yes. a fun bookmark, either. You but you know, part of it. the packaging yes. of that novella yes. really struck me as being something that was uh, that was that was you know that 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 was that was niche and and really just celebrated the material itself. Um, now now is that is that still available or are you are you out of those? No, that's still available. That's you know, I, this is perpetually available through Amazon. You can find it. Okay, so you would direct people to Amazon as opposed to um, to, to to your own you can website. Find the, uh, the printed at Amazon. Um, you can find the audio version also through Amazon or directly through Audible because Amazon owns Audible. But you'll find it at both places. Oh, very cool. You know, it's it's interesting. I was recently approached and asked if I would do if I would uh, be willing to uh, do a documentary about the what is it 40th anniversary of Logan's Run. Is it forty years? Yeah, ago? forty. I think fortieth oh. anniversary. I was I was recently approached and asked if I. I don't know if it'll happen, but uh, apparently there's some major event happening in Toronto, and Michael York's involved. Wow! And right. and the it's promoter of the event that. reached yeah. out and said, "Would you be willing to do this?" Why not? Oh, well, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have when, to see. When I'm, is it again? Oh, that's next year. Uh, I'm, I'm, you, I'm you, cut, you cut out for a moment. What? What yeah, is the project, it, Anthony? I, 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 was approached, uh, I was approached about uh, doing a documentary on Logan's Run uh, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the film. There's some major event taking place in Toronto next year that Michael York is involved mm. in. And um, I was asked if I'd be interested in doing a document, I, uh, which, of course, I, I'm, I'm open to, you know. Mm. Um, it's 99.9% it's wow. of the things that come... That are that are presented to you don't happen, and it's probably the same in the publishing industry. I'm sure too. Ninety percent of those ideas never get out, you know, never see the light of day. But it's that small percentage that does, and those are magical moments. The JFK assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Anthony, would you have any yeah. questions that you ever wanted to ask Ted? Is Ted on the line? It's yeah. Ted, it's Ted, Ted, you're there, right, buddy? I just want to bring you back into the conversation. That's why. How you doing, Ted? Hey, it's great to have you. Hey, how are you? Fan of your show. I, I, uh, I've been uh, such a beneficiary of just hundreds of hours of content that you guys have. Uh, generously put together. I know you're working at your own passions, put it out there, but it's a, an amazing body of content. And I know uh, we've griped a little bit this year with the output. You guys have been busy, but I really want to thank you for all the uh, free entertainment um, and the education and the genre. Excellent stuff. Oh, there's so much more to come, too. I mean, you know, we, we, do, have, we do have many, many, many other ideas that we want to see, uh, uh, you know, um, can come to fruition on the program, um, and Anthony. One subject which we do want to, um, to to breach at some point, and this ties into a lot of your own recent posts on the program. And I think Ted will concur with me. Is classic TV horror? I have I have just lapped up um, the the posts that you've been making online celebrating films like uh, Gargoyles mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the haunting of. Uh, uh, the Haunting of Helena Walker, uh, you know, like like these are these are films from the six, from the seventies, eighties, and nineties that I grew up on as a you know as as a kid just devouring these when they were on like the CBS Movie of the Week or on ABC, and I and I think that really uh, television horror movies of the week um, have been sorely overlooked in the annals of uh, of, of 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 cinematic horror. Yeah, it's, it's been exciting for me to find these things. I, I began kind of pulling on this thread, and I realized there's really a lot there. There are a lot of these. Um, now, now, some of them you can't see. You know, there are certain uh, movies that you can't see, but many you can. There, there are things that have been rerun on cable, and thankfully someone videotaped it, and you know, through the magic of YouTube, you can find these things. Who knows what's legal or not, but... These things that would otherwise never see the light of day uh, can be seen and known. So I've just been kind of documenting them. And as I've been doing it, I've been building up, I've been posting them. I, I've been treating it as kind of like a, a daily column. I haven't, my outfit hasn't been quite daily uh, these days, but I've been putting up uh, review after review. And I've been, uh, and just to give you the scope of how many uh, things I've documented, I, I 
I've been building basically a manuscript for a book that will yeah. chronicle these. I've, I've, I've got about 50,000 words written. Um, wow. I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of movies documented. Good for you. And I've made a lot of wonderful discoveries. Anthony, so, when it's uh, ready, please let me know, and I'll have you on the show to promote it. Yeah, that, oh, that's right. third generous, Brent. Yeah, oh, I'd no, love no, to no, do no. That. It'd be my pleasure, my friend. You know, there, there, there is a title, Anthony, that I've decided I'm going to. Um, there is a particular title that I can't mention actually on air um, that I actually had to sign a waiver on years ago that I would never share with anyone. No joke. The producers so had me sign that. a waiver, but it's something that is considered a bit of a holy grail of television horror, and uh, I've. Yeah. Uh, um, what, my, my idea to say thank you for everything you've done in the past uh, the past few weeks with Christmas Carol was to to send you off a copy. So there, there's something special that'll be coming for you that uh, I think you're going to want to include in your book. Um, you know, you know what I recently I want to bring Ted back. Cool. Ted, yeah. When you were growing up, what was what did you gravitate towards on television in terms of horror? Uh, well, I mean, we've covered the subject matter, and uh, I mean, my my history with TV horror is pretty in depth. Meaning, I was a uh, I was a total cable kid, you know. I just grew up on the uh, idiot box. So, yeah, I have lots of recollections of these movies of the week, and you know, it's funny because speaking of just recent watches, uh, not too long ago, a few weeks back, I pulled out a, my copy of Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, ah. which is one of my personal cool. favorites. It's from '81. Yeah, and uh, of course it's been remade. I think just uh, well, maybe last year. I think it's very recent. But that classic film is the sort of thing that uh, you, you just don't see these kind of projects by network television anymore. Um, you don't. Yeah, wonderful. Why do you think that is, guys? You guys, were, you guys were speaking of. Uh, uh, you guys were talking about Del Toro earlier. Yes, sir. And uh, I recently revisited the, the original Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. With oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He, Never saw that he produced it. He didn't direct it. But, um, it, you know, and there was a reasonable version of it. I, I don't dislike the remake, but there's something really powerful about that original 1973 film. It came out about this time of year, just pre-Halloween, back, you know, a little over 40 years ago. And revisiting it, I just found it so powerful. You know, you kind of have to suspend, um, not just disbelief, but suspend, you know, your sense of, you know, we're looking at it through the lens of the modern world. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit older now, but what a wonderful film. I agree. I, I, to, I, to me, that's one of the potent ones. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with you. That that film actually is very powerful. I, I think the attestation to that is is people's recollections of it when they saw it on television, how it stuck with them. Um, the original film is such a bizarre and surreal experience. Again, it's like The Exorcist. You're watching it and you feel uncomfortable mm. as it unfolds. I, I, I also recently uh, rewatched the uh, the House of Usher with Martin Landau and Robert Hayes. I don't know if you've come across that in your travels. But that was a television production from the early 80s that uh, that is certainly worth a look. Very gothic. I don't think it was a Dan Curtis production, but it was certainly in the same vein. Oh, really? Yeah. I, mean, I don't uh, think I know that one. <laughs> I can help you out with that. I will help you out with that one. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Lisa, are you aware of any of these shows? You grew up on Goosebumps, uh, right? I did. I grew up on Goosebumps. Was that terrifying are... for you to sit in and watch that? No. No, what um, terrified you as a child? I, I enjoyed Are You Afraid of the Dark as well. I grew uh, up on that Canadian um, shot show. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. Canadian. Oh, shows, oh, the, I, the good, the good Canadian shows. There's. I, I, I just, I, sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just remembered a title that really, that really stuck with me from 19. What's that? Was it 89 or 91? Amityville 4: The Evil Escapes with uh, oh, Patty yeah. Duke. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember that. That stuck. I have it on DVD too, but that that really stuck with me. I don't know if it holds up now, but I, there was a period of time where Patty Duke was doing all these different yeah. uh, uh, movies of the week, um, and, and and several of them were horror. There was another one uh, called I think it was just called The Haunting. Man, or, you're good. Or you're The Haunting good. or something. I'm good because I, I, I can't. I remember no? the Amityville one. Yeah, the Evil one. Escapes with the haunted lamp. This giant globe lamp that had these really? this this cast iron it looked like this evil tree oh it was one wow. anthony have you seen that one the the amityville uh evil escape yes yeah i've seen that one there's a a moment though that's unintentionally comic in there where you see the evil bulge its way through the lamp's electrical cord like yes. something out of the, uh, a max fleischer cartoon yes it's, it's kind of funny 
That's true. <laughs> yes, you are um, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Evil lamp, really? An evil lamp, but a big evil yeah. lamp. The electrical bills uh, are Patty Duke shows up in uh, she it. shows up in many telefilms in the seventies. I've documented a bunch of them. Uh, stuff like Curse of the Black Widow by Dan Curtis. Oh, I love seen that one. Very good one. Uh, yes. If you search actually the horror etc. group page for Curse of the Black Widow, you'll hit the post that I put out there. Um, is, is that where it starts, guys? Several, but, but, and they're they're all interesting. I'm going to ask Lisa this and bring Lisa into the conversation a little bit more. Is that where it starts, Lisa, when you're a kid? Is that where your love of horror comes from? When comes you're from... a kid? When you're when you're exposed to it as a child, do you think? Probably, yeah. yeah. Like I said, I grew up with, well, it, it started with Are You Afraid of the Dark, the, the right. Canadian TV series. Yes. And I, I like to read Goosebumps when I was a kid. I never really got... I like to read her Goosebumps from time to time, too. Mm -hmm. Huh? That's a whole I'm different show. I'm folks. sorry. Yes, that's right. <laughs> he thinks he's funny. Just go with it. I, I <laughs> and I used to read, you know, in those magazines that no longer show those pictures. I used to just read the articles. Honest to God. Oh, yeah, Brian. Yeah, 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 you did. The only well, person wearing glasses here. <laughs> the nuns were right, folks. That's all I can say. Uh, Anyways, uh, to but... to jump out of that mode. Yes. It, it, so it start. How about you, Ted? Is that where it started with you? Your love of horror. Was it well, sure, as, that, as a child? As a child? I, I think that that's, that, that's a, probably a primary factor for a lot of genre fans, right? It, it's experiences you have at impressionable ages that, uh, well, they do that rewiring in your brain that makes you want more. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what it is, but I think it's a chemical reaction. I'm no doctor. Uh, yeah, but I don't think huh. that, that precludes someone from becoming a convert either. I, I've, I've known people that essentially just shunned the genre outright until adulthood, at which point they try out a few things and they realize, wow, these are really effective movies and, and they start to explore. It, it's a cool thing to see. Anthony, um, when uh, like, 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 do you have a, a release date set for the book? Are you close to being finished this book? Uh, I'm just trying to get it done <laughs> right now. Yeah. But um, I'm getting close. I'm, I'm I'm at that point where I realize I can I could keep going, or or I can set cut of, set a cutoff point. And what I really need to do is just make sure I have uh, the rest of the essentials that ought to be in any self-respecting book with a, a title of TV Terror on it, and uh, just get those things done. And I'll I'll cap it off. And my plan is to publish it, have it perpetually in print. Uh, by self-publishing it on demand, so I can revise it at will whenever I want. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and, good uh, point. Yeah, and, and like so you said, it'll, it'll be a bit of a living document that way. And uh, you know, uh, and one more, just a, a, a really a tribute to this pool of talent that has all revolved around the horror etc. community. I've reached out to a wonderful comic book artist. He was one of the calendar contributors, I believe, John Souter. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't yeah. that nice? And we're 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 working up a cover, and it's it's going to hit all the right notes that would communicate its contents. I cannot wait to read the book. I think I think yeah. that's going to be um, that's going to be a title that um, that we'll have to. Uh, I, Ted, I think we can build an entire episode around that title. Yeah, I think so too. So By the way. Gonna, yeah. Please, please, Ted, answer. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing. Here, here. Yeah. I, I want, just wanted to say a shout out to Kelly Logue because Kelly's got a book coming out too, an illustrated uh, book, and I'm very anxious to have him on the show. And Kelly, thank you again. Oh, what's the book about? The bottom. Um, it's it's a horror based fantasy book, and uh, it's just fabulous. And uh, cool. you know, I'm really it, looking forward to having him on the show as well. And, and Anthony Bertolo actually struck upon a, um, a, a very valid point. This is a wonderful time for creators. It's a wonderful time to be an artist, a creator. Yes, sir. Because you are in control yes. of your of your work. You're able to. Yeah. You are able to self publish. Now, again, there there is a downside in that because what's some, the downside, Anthony? Because you're a creator. The, the, the downside is because everybody and his brother can make a film and get it out there. Every 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 individual and his brother can make a film and get it out there, right? That's the, that's that's that, that's the issue. Is that 
now there is an oversaturation. How do you promote? How do you market? But how do you get your work seen? Some of them are good, and some of them are not. There's so much good out there, and it's a matter of getting it seen. Getting it's a matter of you know being able to um, to 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 hit the right stops along the way so that you're able to find that bridge to get product yes. into people's hands because as, as a creator yes you do it for the passion but you want to be able to share that passion the end product yes the end goal yes. is you want people to see you do a show that you want people to yeah. watch and listen to mm -hmm. you know we make films because we want people to see them and be moved and go through an emotional journey with them anthony and writes books because want he wants tell. yes yeah. and anthony writes books because he wants people to read them you know he wants yeah. to be able to share his vast knowledge um it and comes down to a subject that you're passionate about well I, 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 exactly. So you know, how do you how do you reach people? Well, or a story. I, I I I think now people are really attuned to the fact that you can go on to a, to a place like Amazon mm -hmm. and find anything that you're looking for. And I find that my own searches are getting much more creative now than they've ever been before. I think we're evolving, and people are people are discovering. You know, it's okay to go outside of mainstream to purchase yes. something that's independent. Yes. That's on. Uh, that's an imprint to purchase a CDR, yeah. to purchase a DVDR, to purchase a digital download. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people are, are willing to embrace this because you look at it this way. Okay, um, in the past, self-published titles um, were of varying quality, right? And to find a good self-published book, it would usually be exceptionally uh, pricey. But now, with so many people. Um, uh, you know, uh, in possession of, of e-readers like Kindles and Kobos and Nooks, mm -hmm. um, an e-book, be it from Simon and Schuster or be it from uh, an, an individual sole proprietor uh, uh, imprint, uh, there there's no difference, right? There's you're no difference you're not that. distracted by a variance in in standard quality. It all comes down to the beast, which is the the art itself, the work itself. Anthony, as a publisher, what are some of the obstacles that you face day to day? Um, well, for me, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm small time. This, I'm, this is, a, again, more of a hobby press thing. I think the biggest challenge is, find, is really, really just finding the thing that's going to uh, light your fire. And like Anthony was saying earlier on the call, these projects... He was speaking in relation to his filmmaking, have a big kind of chew you up and stitch out. <laughs> By the time you're done, you may even be just sick to death of what it was that you began doing. Huh. You get this thing done, and uh, but you, you had better be passionate about it. I think that's the, the challenge, and it's, it's what's going to push you and drive you and, uh, and expect you to keep going. So, Ted, let me ask uh, you I began this project of chronicling all these TV shows about a year ago. And I'm still going, and I'm still excited about it. I'm still making discoveries. Um, so you, you have to have that. Ted, let me ask you this to bring you back in the conversation. You know, most creators are creating for a dollar sign. Does that matter to you as a consumer? Are you looking more for the quality, not the quality of the product, but the story and the storytelling rather than the glitz around it? Well, Brett, as I'm sure as you well know, all the all films, if we're talk, talking about the film industry, I guess we can include all media, is produced with an eye on generating uh, earnings. I mean, that's the point underlying all of it, unless you're into you know, performance art or something a little bit more abstract. But the idea is to earn a living. And I don't mind that films are produced or books are printed with the object of generating sales. That's okay. It's when the uh, it's when you cross the line into uh, pandering, shilling, and just uh, grinding out uh, redundancies. That I mean, and we know we know material that we're so familiar with when we see it that it's it, it's a frustration for me. And I'm looking for original ideas, whether they're performed, yes. whether they're executed well or not. It's the uh, the new ideas. Maybe not all of them are going to fly. You know, you're gonna have some missteps along the way. But I always appreciate when uh, film. Filmmaker, scriptwriter, author, whoever, whatever, is putting forth a genuine idea that is original and trying to further a concept that's unique. That that always wins the day for me. Me? <laughs> well, I I think I'm a bit of a hack actually, but, no, but no, we no. appreciate your you support. You want original <laughs> ideas, folks? Triple W. Night Fright Show. Click on Anthony's oh, CD kind. covers, 
and uh, that'll prove to you that there's original ideas still out there and flourishing. Well, no, and I, it's not all about huge budgets. It's well, about ideas. Well, listen, you know what? I'm going to get involved in what uh, Ted would uh, coin the uh, the affectionate circle jerk, and uh, you know, I'm going to say that you know, Brent That's Holland. A lovely term. But it's true, Brent Holland. You've oh. got you've got a very very specific niche, a unique niche that you've carved for yourself. Facing the odds, you're putting yourself out here every week. Okay, you are producing free content that is exceptionally produced. Every episode that you put up mm -hmm. has between You're 50 to 100 good. hours of work. Very I know, good. I've seen you working on these. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Anthony Rotolo is out there. He's creating work that he's sharing with people. Yes. Again, like you said, it's for him, it's it's something smaller that he's doing uh, for, for passionate purposes. Ted, who is sitting, um, you know, in, in the nation's capital right now, who has been doing a podcast the Horror Etc. podcast yeah. with some strange co-host for, for quite some time. I mean, you know, again, they're, they're, at the end of the day, the only reward is the work itself exactly. and, and the community that you create, the, you know, how your work impacts and inspires others. Lisa, who is also an actress and who has, you know, she comes out Sometimes. of the, well, she comes out of the community theater world where, you know, she, she gives and gives and gives for the love of the art and sharing it with an audience with absolutely no remuneration. Well, you have to, right? You, you do. You absolutely do. Um, How do we get that concept, guys, all together? Because we're all creators in our own sense. How do we get that concept concept across to Joe Average that doesn't doesn't get it? They go to work every day for a paycheck and they don't understand how we do what we do. And the paycheck is important because everybody likes to eat, especially me. But it's not the reason, it's not the raison d'etre, it's not the reason why we are. You have to understand that Joe Average is, 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 is never going to change his or her uh, perception of, uh, of the value of, of, of the type of work that we or any other creators do. Okay, the very fact that they consider your work to be as disposable as the work of, say, someone like Michael Bay or Larry King mm -hmm. or Stephen King, I mean, that in itself is of interesting value, but it's the person who has listened to all two hours of this episode of Night Fright. It's the individual who has downloaded and listened to an entire spate of horror, etc. Mm -hmm. episodes. It's the individual who is going to pre-order and devour and enjoy Anthony Bertolo's book on horror mm -hmm. films. It's the individual who has bought Ghost Keepers and sat back and watched it and is pleased to have it in their collection. These are the people um, that, uh, that we have to celebrate. And mm -hmm. if that audience never grows, if it never gets beyond that very select group, at least it's still a legacy yeah. that we you, leave behind. You could say that Joe Average doesn't have to get it. It's the people who are, who are passionate about the project. That's those are the people that really matter, right? Anthony, what would you say? You know, I always equate it with a um, a car race. Uh, you you're you're always better off in a Ferrari to win a race, but most people just drive a uh, a Volkswagen or something of that nature. How do we equate the two when there's no money involved? Anthony, I I, I was that. Directed at me, I couldn't hear you too well, Brent. Oh, okay. I was just going to ask you. You know, I always use the analogy of a car race, where if you want to win the race, you're always better in an F1 Ferrari or as opposed to say uh, a Hyundai, which I'm driving right now because yep. uh, somebody rammed into my car, <laughs> and it's not a great car, folks. It really isn't. But how your, your do other I... your other car is a formula racer, yeah. <laughs> but you know the people look at the two products um, when it comes to entertainment as equal. Not so on the uh, the racetrack. How do we get people to realize that? Yeah, there's films that are made with micro budgets. There are books that are published with micro budgets as opposed to say the Stephen Kings that are published with huge budgets. Or the um, well, fifty million dollars for the recent uh, Crimson Peak movie. How do we get people to realize that there is a difference? You know, um, it really it's it's amazing. I, I I appreciate that analogy, but I also I've often thought of how in the musical realm you can listen to a full orchestra. You know, you can go and see uh, the Boston Pops or something. And uh, there's all that production value. Or you can listen to one guy with a folk guitar. And if the, the material is compelling, it fills the same space. Yeah. You know, it may not have all the 
pomp and circumstance. But uh, you know, I'm a Bob Dylan fan. So I'm listening to this guy with a bad voice, and it's just him and a and a guitar. And uh, but it fills the whole space. It fills your intellectual space. Um, so then take the example of a director like Gareth Edwards, who with a very small budget, he makes a film like Monsters. And on the merit of that, he suddenly finds himself helming Godzilla yeah. last year. Hmm. You know, it's just, it's a really amazing thing. And, and uh, it's a reminder that the, the cream will rise to the top. Okay, wow. that's a good answer. Ted, we've only got 30 seconds left. Is there anything you want to leave the folks with? Uh, no, I just, other uh, than 2016, I think is the year of Eli Roth. Right, he's got uh, Green Inferno, Knock Knock, and uh, well, I don't know about Meg, but it's coming down the pipe. Eli Roth. Okay, and uh, Lisa, is there anything you want to leave the folks with? You've got about ten seconds. Thanks for having me on the show. It's Thank been fun. You. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Thank you very Halloween. much for all your support. Ooh. And uh, thank you, Brent Holland, for putting on a great show every week. Every week, listen to the Brent Holland Show, no matter what you do. Triple W. Yes. Night Fright Show. Just click on Anthony's uh, CD covers, DVD covers, I should say. Apologies. And uh, order the order the DVDs from the comfort of your own home. There's the music in the background. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Goodbye. Ted. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. We'll Goodbye, see you all man. next time. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. <laughs>